ketosis today. Yep. Is this a new lecture? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had 6 a.m. breakfast this morning. I'm a little off. But, um, Okay, this is a new lecture, everyone. My sisters. Okay, so this is the first day of ketosis. Alright, it's Friday. So, um, mitosis. Mitosis is one part of cell division. Mitosis is really going to be um, a part of cell division that deals with dividing the nucleus. The rest of the cell is divided up in a process called cytokinesis. Uh, but the cell is regulated in this life cycle called the cell cycle. And cells need to divide for a variety of reasons. So one of the tenets of the cell theory is that all cells come from other cells. And so cells have to divide to replace cells, which would be growth, or to add cells, I should say, which would be growth, to generate new cells and new organisms, which would be for reproduction, and then to replace cells, which would be repair. So there's a variety of different uh, reasons that cell growth and or cell division is important to grow, to reproduce, to repair tissue. And we don't want the growth to be totally unrestricted. We want to have the growth regulated. And so we're going to regulate growth of the cell. By the cell cycle. Now again, the term cycle is this is just the way that it's easiest for humans to understand this biological phenomenon. It's cyclical, meaning that there's really no beginning or no end. And it's just simply the model that we are going to use to describe the events that occur during these processes of growth, reproduction, and repair. So you can see a picture here of the overall cell cycle, and we'll talk about each part here in brief, but eventually we're going to get down to the real nitty-gritty details of mitosis. Um, because ultimately, mitosis is where most of the um, reproductive and duplication of DNA processes are going to occur, which is essential to generate a new viable cell. So in order to understand the cell cycle and understand what's going on, we have to have a little bit of the concept of the chromosome, because mitosis is going to be able to make sure that our chromosomes are equally divided at the end of the cell cycle as we regenerate a new cell or as we produce a new cell. So it's very important for our chromosomes during that cell division process to facilitate accurate distribution of the chromosomes. In other words, if I have 46 chromosomes as I do as a human, I produce a new cell, I want to have exact copies of those 46 chromosomes in that new cell, and the exact 46 chromosomes in the original cell as well. So both cells would be viable, the new cells and the old cells that are produced. So the chromosome, we have to accurately distribute our chromosomes into the new forming cells at a deeper level because the chromosome consists of DNA, which is our genetic material, and proteins, we need to be able to synthesize copies of that genetic material and have proteins available to repackage that genetic material into the new chromosome. And this whole process 
is going to occur at specific times within the life of the cell, the life of the dividing cell. In other words, at specific times in the cell cycle. So this is where we're leading. We're going to go towards this process of reproducing or duplicating the chromosomes, repackaging that DNA around proteins to form the chromosome, and then distributing equal copies or equal numbers of those chromosomes so both cells have identical versions of, the, of all the chromosomes that are required for that cell to survive. But in order to do that, I want to start with organization of the DNA. And it's possible that I'm going to dis disband some bits that you may have from chromosomes. So real quick, on your paper, little quiz. Zero point quiz. Those are always fun, right? I want you to draw a picture of a chromosome. Oh, good. In what state? So what are the options? Okay, so could you draw a chromosome in interface? And what would it look like? And what do we call that? Jumping the mess. We call it chromatin or the chromatin now. Now, you've already been primed, which is good because you've had a lab on mitosis already. But most people, if I ask, just go out, report it on the street. Hey, can you draw a picture of a chromosome for me? Most people, they would draw something like this. Most people would say no. Yeah, most people would say a chromosome? What? Is that, is that like a superhero? <laughs> so most people, if they know what a chromosome is, if you get past their inerrant high school education, we draw something that looks similar to that. So is that accurate? What's that? At certain times, it is accurate, but not 100% of the time. And the big myth is that this is what a chromosome always looks like inside of the cell. And only for a very small fraction of the 24-hour period is the chromosome going to be condensed down into that structure, which is called the chromatin. Most of the time, it's in this structure called the chromatin. But we run into a real problem here. Human genome right now is 3.5. The best estimates we have are 3.5 billion nucleotides. So kind of picture in your mind these big, long threads of DNA. And you have 46 of these big, long threads of DNA. Chromosome 1 is the longest. Chromosome 21 is the shortest. 22 is a little bit longer than 21. And then you have 23, which is your, uh, your sex chromosome. So your XY for male, XX for female. So if I were to take this infinitely long, in terms of cells, the infinitely long thread of a chromosome or of a DNA molecule that goes into chromosome 1, I have a problem. Because I have to pack this down. I have to get it short enough that it fits into a tiny space inside of this. In terms of digital computing, we haven't figured out how to put the same type of information in the same volume of space. There are some microprocessors out there in the world of computing that hold a ton of information but not even close to the information contained in every single cell that we have on the planet. Even the smallest known organism, which is quantins, uh, nano archaea quantins, it has 500,000 base pairs in its genome. Now this is a lot easier to handle than the 3.5 billion that we have in humans, but there's even organisms that have more genetic material. We're diploid which means we have two copies of each of our chromosomes. Strawberries are hot, meaning they have eight copies of their genetic material. And they actually have more chromosomes than we do. So how does, how does life actually accomplish this feat of packing massive amounts of information into a small, tiny little volume of the nucleus? And the way that this is accomplished is through organization of the DNA into a variety of different 
levels of compaction. So here is an electron micrograph of what's called the uncoiled chromatin. Um, so it's the thin thread-like structures. This is not just the DNA. You're not looking at the double helix here. What you're looking at is the thread of DNA wrapped around proteins called histones to help keep the chromosome structure together. So the chromosome really is not just DNA. The chromosome is proteins plus the DNA. Plus there's also some arteries that we find in there as well. So most of the time, DNA is organized into this chromatin network. And as such, we have a long, thin fiber made up of the DNA molecule and associated proteins. So our long, thin fiber, the DNA, the double helix of the DNA, to form this long, thin fiber is wrapped systematically around proteins. So if I were to draw the nucleus, well, first let me draw this kind of idea here. You have the DNA, and then you have these little sections called nucleosomes, and the DNA wraps around the nucleosomes, and we have another nucleosome, and our DNA wraps around that. And so, just simply by putting them around the nucleosome, I can shorten that long thread of material because I'm wrapping it around, basically spooling it around a, uh, a protein. And then from there, I begin to put in a zigzagging pattern. So this sort of looks like a string of beads. In fact, it's often called a string of beads. It sort of looks like this when it's all pulled out. And you have this small section of DNA called the linker. And then you have two and a half or one and a half rotations or one and a half spools around each of those histones, which is a complex of eight different proteins. The structure here from the linker DNA over to here is called the nucleosome. Just this part here, this is the linker. Just this part around the histone is called the core particle. So you have the core particle and the linker, and collectively they make up the nucleosome. From here, what I begin to do is I begin to put in these zigzagging patterns. And so I go from this really long, thin, this long, thin uh, thread of DNA, and I begin to spool it. And that shortens the overall length. And then I begin to put it in this in the zigzags, and it makes it much thicker in, uh, in width, but it begins to compact it even further. And then I begin to throw in these irregular turns, and this helps me to compact even further. Now by doing this, I can take that compact structure through my three different levels of compaction. Level one is the nucleosome, string of beads. Number two is the zigzags, and number three is the random coils. And I end up with the molecule being able to be wrapped up pretty tightly, not too tight though, in one specific region inside of the nucleus. So we take the long thin filament, we wrap it up around the proteins, put it into a zigzag pattern, then throw in some random coils, and pack it away in that compact form contained in certain region of the nucleus. And that certain region is typically called the chromosomes region or the chromosome area. And so inside of the cell, if I were to go in there, I might find chromosome one from mom is here, chromosome one from dad's over here, and chromosome 23 is here, chromosome 18 is here, and so on and so forth. And if you kind of picture this in the three-dimensional space that we're dealing with, you have the chromosomes kind of packed away in their own little space, a little region inside of the cell. And so we go from having these 46 humans, 46 long, filaments of DNA containing 3.5 billion nucleotides able to compact down to a small enough size that we can fit it into a volume as small as a nucleus in all of our cells. So that's the chromatin network. It's this loose network of coiled DNA zigzagged and thrown into random coils that fit into the chromosome 
area of a chromosome region in the, in the nucleus of the cell. And this is the majority of the time what we're going to see for our chromosomes. Now, interphase, certainly it looks like that. S phase, it's going to continue to look like this chromatin network, but something happens there in S phase. So that first part of um, from G1 through S phase, the first two steps of interphase, we're in that chromosome G, uh, region in the chromatin network. S phase, something begins to happen called DNA duplication. You can remember what S phase does because the DNA is going to be synthesized. So S for synthesize, the synthesis phase. DNA is duplicated. So that means that our 46 chromosomes, how many would we have after duplication? You can't do the math, you just tell me the equation. It's 92. And how'd you get there, Kate? Yeah, so 46 chromosomes duplicate to have 46 plus 46. What if the organism had 76 chromosomes? At the end of duplication, it would be 76 plus 76. So S phase is for DNA duplication. Then following duplication, the structure begins to change. Immediately following duplication, you have this thing called S2, I'm not S2, G2. And G2 is just to double check to make sure that all of the resources are available, that we've completely doubled our 46 chromosomes to 92 chromosomes, and that we're ready to progress. And so we're trying to get this go-ahead signal after our double check to go into mitosis. So once we go into mitosis, so following the duplication of the structure, or following the duplication of the chromosomes, our structure begins to change as we enter M phase. And what was the hallmark of the beginning of M phase? Does anyone remember? What's the first step of mitosis? <laughs> prophase. And how did we how were we able to identify prophase? Okay, but can you what did what did the what did the nucleus look like for the interface? Yeah, pretty much interface would have looked something very similar to that. And then we slip into prophase, and prophase begins to look more like that, where there's more light that permeates through. So what's happening here is we're going from our chromatin network, which is diffused throughout the whole cell, doesn't really let a whole lot of light pass through, to now beginning to condense even more. And so now you're beginning to be able to pass more of the microscope's light through the nucleus of the cell. So following duplication, the structure changes as we enter into end phase, or into mitosis. And we begin to go through this compaction. So here is our DNA, our double helix. We begin to wrap it around our histones. We begin to put in our zigzags. And this is our irregular loop forming our chromatin network. Now we begin to take those chromatin network and we begin to condense them even more. And as we begin to condense them even more, as the network begins to condense, B 
these irregular loops that get thrown in there, the total structure begins to wrap around itself even more. So the fiber begins to wrap around itself. Now, does anyone happen to remember what we call this? So chromatin network before this begins to happen, now beginning to enter to prophase of the cell cycle of mitosis, and we're beginning to form. Do you remember the name of the structure? Is that? So as we begin to enter into mitosis, we're slipping out of the chromatin network. We have new, uh, we do a new, into a new structure for our chromatin. Sister, sister, okay. So it's a chromatin. So we begin to form the chromatid. The chromatid individually is half of this structure here. It's going to be bound up through a centromere to a copy of the original chromatid to form the sister chromatid. So individually it's called a chromatid. When we're duplicated and we consider both the original and the duplicated chromosome, we have two chromatid for what we should refer to as sister chromatid. Duplicated chromosomes. We have two chromatid individually. Each chromatid, one's the original, one's the duplicate. It's collectively, they're the sister chromatid. And these sister chromatid are held together joined together by this structure called the centromere. Waste of the chromosome. Now, back to our drawings on chromosomes. What was this? Chromatin or chromatin network. And then we begin to form a structure that looks like this. And what do we call that? Chromatid. And then if we add in a second, Hold them together here at the waist. Sister chromatin. So most people, when they draw the DNA and they draw it like that, that's really the sister chromatin is what they're referencing. But that's the chromosome, and it's not just the DNA. The histones make up the nucleus. Okay, so we're joined together by the centromere, and as we begin to condense. More and more light is able to pass through, and so in light microscopy, we can begin to visualize this form of the chromosome. Okay, so one of the things that you need to be able to do when you're dealing with chromosomes and their separation is you need to be able to keep track of the number of chromosomes in each of the different cells. Okay? So tracking chromosome numbers, now I'm going to give you specific example of tracking chromosomes in humans. So how many total chromosomes in humans? Okay, so 46 chromosomes in humans, can you express it in another way? 23 pairs. And 
power the pair to fit up. One set is for mom and one set is for dad. So those 23 pairs, they're not identical pairs necessarily. In fact, probably not at all. There may be parts of the chromosome that have similarities or are the same, same lengths of each individual chromosome. The DNA and the nucleotide sequence for certain genes may be identical. But the overall complete chromosomes in the pair are not perfectly identical. Because if they were, then your mom and dad would look totally the same. All right, so we have 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs. Let's track these chromosome numbers. So I'm just going to start out at G1. So G1, this is our um, starting point, although there really isn't a starting point because we're dealing with the cycle. But we're going to just arbitrarily say G1 is where we're going to start with the cell cycle. G1 is part of what phase? Overall phase. Interphase. So G1 is part of interphase. What's happening during G1? Anyone know? It's actually normal cell function. And part of that normal cell function is going to be a little bit of growth. So during this normal cell function in G1, I'm going to have my chromosomes. And how many am I going to have in humans? I'm going to have 46 or 23 pairs. So if I want to represent this mathematically in a more general model sense, I can call that 2x, where x equals the number of chromosome pairs, or the number in the chromosome pair. So x in this case equals 23. 2 times 23 gives me my 46. So I can represent both of these numbers as x and then 2x. OK, does everybody see what I'm doing there? All right, what happens during S phase? Synthesis. And what am I synthesizing? So I'm synthesizing or I'm duplicating my chromosomes. So from a mathematical perspective, how do I double two X? that? It's square, you're going to double it? So let's, let's, let's try that out. Um, what is, okay, I'm just simply multiplying by two. So I'm going to double my original 2x, and that equals 4x. What is x? X always equals 23, so what is 4x? Over times 23, which is 92. Everybody see where this is going? Okay, how about once we get into G2? What does my chromosome look like in G2? So let's take it from just humans. How many chromosomes in G2 are going to be present in the human cell? G2. 92. So can you put it into our mathematical model? Four X. There you go. Everybody way overthinking this. Biology is for students. So since you're all too brilliant to be biologists, you've got to dumb down your thinking a little bit. Don't overthink it. Become stupid. 
don't really become stupid. But everybody's like, oh my gosh. And so we're talking about biological systems. And I mean, it's, there's so much going on in bio. I mean, think about all of the metabolic pathways that we've already. No, it's just simply double. You haven't done anything else, so we remain double. So that's four pets. It's not normal cell function anymore because we have the 46 or the, the 92 chromosomes, the 4x. So what's happening there is we're basically going through this process of saying, do I have enough resources to divide this cell? And so we do sort of this double check every time I hear that. Aaron and we just kind of double check. So we're doing that double check just to make sure that everything is good to go. And if it's not, then we have to collect some additional resources. So G2 is a little bit of additional growth. It's just kind of that final step before we go in and do the energetically costly, energetically costly process of dividing the cell and dividing the nucleus. So in terms of mitosis, just in general, what is going to happen to our chromosome number? Going into mitosis, how many chromosomes are we going to have in our cell? So it's mathematically 4x. And coming out the other end, we've now divided. We have now two brand new cells. So we've gone from one cell to two cells. So at the end of mitosis, what's our mathematical representation of the chromosome number? We're back down to 2x and two individual cells. Now, why did I just do it this way? Why did I just do it in terms of 4x, 2x? Because now I can tell you that an organism, a diploid organism like a cat has a total of 78 chromosomes. And it's in two pairs. And so then you can calculate your x from there. So 78 divided by 2 is going to be 39. So they have 39 pairs. Now all you have to do is plug in the 39, and you can figure out how many chromosomes they, how many chromosomes they have in each stage. So it's 78 at, two, at uh, um, G1, and then it's going to double. And it's going to be 4x times 39, or 4 times 39. And then down here, it'll continue to be 4 times 39. And then we're going to go from 4 times 39 to 2 times 39 to 2 times 39. So now you just have that general mathematical model. I can give you any diploid organism's chromosome, uh, chromosome number, and you can tell me exactly how many chromosomes all the So you're not going through and just memorizing humans. 23 pairs, 46 chromosomes, and you take the magnitude of the divide by 126 cells, and you can do it with any of those. Okay. Uh, I guess one more thing that I should add in here. When the cells divide, we end up with basically two nuclei or two forming nuclei during telophase. And then as telophase ends, we go through cytokinesis cell division. And this is where we get the two separate packets, two new nuclei, two new cell, cells um, after cell division. All right, so now that you know the numbers of cells uh, and chromosomes in those cells as we go through this whole cell cycle process, what about the cell cycle now here in pictures? So 
So just to give you some better detail here, G2 of interface is going to look very similar to S and it's going to look very similar to G1 of interface. We're going to have the nucleus and the chromatin network. And then as we go into prophase, we begin to condense our chromosomes, our duplicated chromosomes into their sister chromatin. Because here, we have duplicated our DNA, right? But we don't call it sister chromatin yet. We just call it duplicated DNA in the chromatin network. It's not until they begin to uh, condense and they get the centromere around their waist, holding the two together, that we call it the sister chromatin. So um, I want you to be able to basically give me a representation of what cells are going to look like going through the cell cycle. So everybody just kind of give me the steps or the stages of the cell cycle. What's the first one we're going to start with? Okay, do you want an interface? So we're going to start out with interface. And during interface, we basically have G1, S, and G2. And throughout interphase, even though we're duplicating the DNA and S phase, really nothing's changing here. There is no way with a light microscope to identify G1 versus G2 versus S. So interphase simply is just going to be the cell with the nucleus that's loaded up completely and so it looks I'm just such a great artist. It's like taking a scan track test. So it's completely filled up with a dark circle representing the nucleus as the chromosomes are in that compacted yet diffuse structure called the chromatin network. So G1, S, G2 all look very similar. Then we move into mitosis. Now, mitosis has four phases. Anyone give me the four phases in order? Prophase. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase. Pete, Mike, Andy, and Tom. Those are my brothers. That's the order that we were born. I'm not on the list because I'm not that important. So Pete, Mike, Andy, Tom, and then it was Bob. <laughs> but now you're going to remember, right? Pete, Pete Mike, Andy, and Tom. Prophase, metaphase, anaphase, the openings. I can't believe that your brothers are Pete, Mike, Andy, and Tom, and you're a biologist who teach mitosis this week. <laughs> All right, so mitosis is made up of four phases. And when we refer to mitosis, can anyone really give me a definition of mitosis? So when I say the cell is undergoing mitosis, what am I saying? Start here. Speak up. Okay, I don't agree. <laughs> no. It's the vision of what? It's something. It's the vision of the nucleus. So mitosis won't be like, oh yeah, cell division. Cell division is actually not mitosis. Mitosis is referring to mitotic division of the nucleus. So we have four phases that make up nuclear division. What is the cell division called? Cytokinesis, which literally means cell movement. So we use mitosis and the four phases of nuclear division to break apart the nucleus and the contained chromosomes and then to rebuild the nuclear envelope in cytokinesis to split up everything else, the cytosol, the mitochondria, the Golgi complex, the endoplasmic particulate, the ribosomes, the proteins, the enzymes, the membranes, everything else is broken up and split up through cytokinesis. The mitosis or mitotic division simply refers to what's going on with the nucleus. So prophase. 
So what happens there in prophase? What does it look like? They're beginning to have division. Not division. Um, condensation. And so you can pass a little bit more length. And so it looks basically a lot more blotched, if you will. And then we go to metaphase. And what's the hallmark of metaphase? I'm going to play metaphase one. So once we get there, now you can draw your axis representing your sister chromatid. And they're going to line up on this structure called the metaphase plate. And this is where you have to kind of think three dimensionally. If I were to rotate this cell 100 uh, or 90 degrees, so you're looking at the side in a three dimensional scape, that metaphase plate will look. much more like this, where if you look at it from this direction, it just looks like a stack, and then you rotate it 90 degrees, and it's this, they're all kind of stacked up in the middle. Everybody kind of have that three-dimensional, three-dimensional visual in mind. So a metaphase plate begins to form. You're also potentially going to be able to begin to see mitotic uh, spindles forming. And you got the structures called the centrioles that begin to form at the poles or the opposite corners or edges of the of the cell. Next, we begin to go into anaphase, and during anaphase, this is when we begin to have some daylight that shows up between our sister chromatin. So it begins to look like there's a tug of war going on where the cells, two ends of the cells where the centrioles are, begin to pull on the sister chromatid and they begin to break apart that belt or the, uh, the uh, centromere around it. the sister chromatid begins to break apart. But that's actually not what's happening. It may be an appearance, but what really is happening, and we're going to talk more about this, but I'll just note this part so I'm going to give you a little preview. There are proteinaceous plaques on the uh, on the centrum. And those proteinaceous plaques have this motor ability where they actually can begin to walk along the, the mitotic spindle. So the mitotic spindle really is more like a tightrope. And these proteinaceous plaques, these motor proteins, they kind of basically are like proteins that have the chromatid on their back like a backpack. And they begin to walk along that mitotic spindle. And as they walk along, the, the spindle behind them begins to dissociate and break apart. There's a, uh, an enzymatic patch that begins to break apart that, that microtubule structure as the, uh, the centromere walks the, uh, the, each chromatid down towards the pole. That propagation's plaque is called the kinetochore giving rise to, uh, or, or being arisen from kinesiology or science of movement. So you have the kinetic cord that is the protonation block that has that motor protein uh, potential to move and carry that chromatin, that chromatid to the corner of the cell. So it's not that the cell is being pulled, it's actually those chromatin are walking along the mitotic spindle because of the kinetic cord. And then last phase here is telophase or telophase. And in, in, I'm going to draw that up right here. Once we get to this point, we now have basically our nuclei that are beginning to reform. So we have the nuclear envelope that's beginning to reform. The chromosomes are, the chromosomes are beginning to condense or decondense back into the chromosome network. Alongside telophase, we're going to have cytokinesis. How much time do I have here? We're going to have cytokinesis that occurs alongside telophase, and that's where we'll pick up the time.